Welcome to the online service for Oak Park Church of Christ for the week of February the 27th. The final Sunday in February and the final Sunday in our sermon series on the book of Acts to the ends of the earth. Week number nine. I thought um, since it is the final week in a series titled to the ends of the earth, it would be appropriate for a call to worship this morning to read with you from Psalm 67. And so I invite you to read the alternate verses that will be on screen. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make His face shine on us. May the peoples praise You, God. May all the peoples praise You. May the peoples praise You, God. May all the peoples praise You. May God bless us still so that all the ends of the earth will fear Him. Amen. The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to Trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God.
Well, welcome again. Uh, as I said in, in the welcome earlier, this is the final week in our series on Acts to the Ends of the Earth, week number nine, and we're uh, looking at the, the final half of chapter 15. So we are officially more than halfway through the book of Acts, and you're going to have to wait till next year at some point when we come back and do um, Acts part four. Maybe that's what we'll title it, Acts part four, another sermon series on the book of Acts which will probably get us somewhere to about chapter 20, hopefully, at least. Uh, let's begin with a word of prayer and we'll dive in this morning. God, you are uh, the God of the universe, the creator God. Great and mighty are you. We thank you for uh, your gift of life. We thank you that your love endures forever. Today, as, as we come to your word, we humbly submit ourselves under its authority. We ask that you um, open our minds and open our hearts, that together we grow more and more in love with you, and more and more in love with each other, your church, your body. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You ever feel uh, sort of limited by language in some ways? Maybe a preacher shouldn't be admitting that, but I, I always feel like there's, there's like words in other languages that describe things so much better. And I think we should have some of these words in English. So, for instance, my sister-in-law, who uh, was born in the Philippines, tells me that um, in, in Tagalog, there are at least seven words for our word rice. All right? Which makes sense because, you know, they eat rice all the time. All I know is that when I say kanin, what comes out to my plate is what I want. Right? And famously, you know, linguists have, have talked about with the Inuk people in the north of Canada, how they have somewhere between probably 40 and 50 words for snow, which is awesome. So I went through them this week and I, I found my favorite one, and I'm going to butcher all of these translations, all right, or, or these pronunciations. Uh, majag is my favorite Inuk word for snow, which means snow into which one sinks. It's like uh, quick snow, if you will, all right. But did you know, however, with the uh, Inuk people, that there is a word, Iksuarpork, Iksuarpork, which um, is intended to describe the combination of feelings of both anxiety and anticipation when you wait for a guest to arrive at your house. I think that's awesome. I think we should have an English word that meets that sort of threshold as well. There's a, a Japanese saying, that uh, goes, koi no yokan, which means something like, eh, it wasn't exactly love at first sight, but maybe there's some potential here to grow into it, right? Which, uh, can I get an amen from the brothers out there, all right? We need that word. We need that saying in English. Uh, in Georgian, uh, the language, not the southern drawl, in Georgian, there is a word, shimo majamo which not only sounds wicked awesome to say, you should say it if you're at home right now, or on the bus, whatever, uh, but it's a very relatable word because it means the feeling of being completely stuffed but continuing to eat because it just tastes so good, right? Uh, I would be saying shimo majamo all the time, I feel like, at my house. Uh, of all the languages where there's these sort of compound, complex words that mean multiple ideas within one word, I... I think we can all agree that German always takes the cake. There are all these crazy long German words that mean like these really complex, detailed things that we just don't have in English. So one of my favorite is uh, Kummerspeck, um, which <laughs> is defined as the extra weight gained from overeating when you're depressed. And it gets better than that, actually, because the literal translation, if you just translation, translated both words into English, it would be grief bacon, which I absolutely think should be an English word. Like, you know, Lane failed English class and then grief bacon, you know, just packed on the pounds. All right, uh, this is fun, but we should get to the point because there is an actual word that I want to highlight this morning that pertains to the text. Uh, we'll sort of make sense of why I started things off this way. So, uh, there's this German word, and um, again, sorry for the, trans or for the pronunciation, but it's something like Jakobsklausen. Jakobsklausen. And it literally means James Claus. 
a James clause, not like Santa Claus, but like a, like a rhetorical clause or a legal clause in some sense. And it's actually a word that comes from this very chapter. That's where the word was invented from. James clauses. It means this, the cultural sensitivity of respecting the practices of others and not forcing one's way on another because of the difference. So if you are with us last week, you'll um, have some sense of, of where this comes from. There's this conference that meets in Jerusalem, and at the end of the conference, several people speak and share, and then there's sort of a final summary pronunciation from James, the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And he, he sort of makes this pronouncement of um, that the Gentile believers do not need to become Jewish before they become Christian. That there's not this sort of immediate step in between. And then he gives some clauses at the end saying you would do well, though, to abide by these clauses. This is Jacob's clausen. These are James' clauses. You will do well to abide by these sensitivities. Well, let's jump in. Uh, a lot of our text this morning is, is a little bit of summary because it's really just the church in Jerusalem um, writing down in letter form what, what they decided at the conference that we read last week and sending it back to the church in Antioch. So we pick it up in verse 15. Then the apostles, sorry, in verse 22. Then the apostles and elders with the whole church decided to choose some of their own men and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. And they chose Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, men who were leaders among the believers. And with them they sent the following letter. This is the letter. The apostles and elders your brothers, to the Gentile believers. Only here, it's a little unfortunate, the translation, because it actually sort of has this redundancy effect. It's supposed to be the apostles and elders, your brothers, to the Gentile brothers. I think that's actually really important. It's, it's the first time in the book of Acts that Gentile believers have been explicitly referred to as brothers. Not Gentile believers, those other ones over there, no, the, the Jerusalem church is saying from one brother to another brother. Equal. Saved by grace through faith. To the Gentile brothers in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, greetings. We have heard that some went out from us without our authorization and disturbed you, troubling your minds by what they said. In other words, they're saying, look, uh, the men who came and brought these ideas to you in the first place weren't sanctioned messengers from our church. And so there's this, this distancing of the Jerusalem church from these what we call Judaizers, these legalists, saying, no, that they don't speak for us. We didn't endorse this message. And so we all agreed, or uh, we were all of one mind, to choose some men and send them to you with our dear friends Barnabas and Paul. Men, Barnabas and Paul, who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, now here we're sending official delegates, official representatives from our church. And they're not just going from our church. They're going with this letter that we have signed. And to ensure that, that what Paul and Barnabas tell you is in fact true, we're sending these two other men to verify it. These men, Paul and Barnabas, they go further to endorse them. Saying they're not just okay. No, we recognize that they have, they have risked their lives. They have sacrificed for the sake of the gospel. And they hold that in high esteem. Therefore, we're sending Judas, pretty common name, by the way, not the betrayal guy, and Silas, or Silvanus in the New Testament sometimes. Uh, Silas becomes this missionary partner of Paul to Philippi and Thessalonica and Corinth. We're sending them to confirm by word of mouth what we are writing. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. Here are the the Jacob's Clausen. Here are the James Clauses. You are to abstain from food, sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. Four things. A little different order than they talked about them last week. You will do well, they say, to avoid these things. Farewell. I love that ending. I'm thinking about changing my email signature to farewell, lame. It just sounds so dramatic, you know? Verse 30, so the men were sent off and went down to Antioch where they gathered the church together and delivered the letter. 
the people read it and were glad for its encouraging message. Judas and Silas, who themselves were prophets, said much to encourage and strengthen the believers. Two times encouraging. So you know Barnabas had something to do with this, right? Son of encouragement. Uh, Think about it for a minute, though. From the the Gentile believer perspective in Antioch, right? Uh, Things were going really well. In fact, I, I would say things were going great. Their church in this sort of metropolitan center was growing, was, was adding people from all over the world who had come there for uh, work or other related issues. And then they had sent off Paul and Barnabas to, to Galatia, and they had preached, and they had this, this great sort of response from Gentile believers in Asia Minor. And they were seeing growth, and they were seeing the gospel reach out to the ends of the earth. And then you have these, um, these men who come from the mothership, <laughs> the Jerusalem church, right? And they say, well, actually, no, what you're doing is is not right. And in fact, you Gentile believers that haven't become Jewish first, you're not even real believers. You you have to become Jewish, and then you can become Christian in order to be saved. So everything's thrown into confusion and chaos. They don't know what to do. It says it brought uh, Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute with them, right? So what do they do? We've got to figure this out. So they send Paul and Barnabas as representatives, leaders down to the Jerusalem church for this little conference. And they would have been waiting certainly for weeks, if not months, to, to see exactly what would have happened. Right? There's no texts home. Here's how the conversation's going. Right? They're just waiting. They're waiting to see if, if their salvation is valid is true if what they've been preaching if what they've been proclaiming as the gospel of jesus christ is in fact the real gospel and then back come paul and barnabas with judas and silas and this letter in hand and it's opened up and it's read and they they realize that nothing has been added as essential for salvation this is reason to celebrate It's reason to praise God. It's kind of a big deal. You know, the NIV translation here, I think, doesn't quite do it justice. They were glad for its encouraging message. Sounds so formal. It's a public announcement or something. Uh, Peterson paraphrases it in the message. They were greatly relieved and pleased. Which, yeah, sure, of course they're relieved and pleased. I still don't think that quite gets the connotation of how they would have been feeling. The, the ESV is a little bit better, and actually a lot of translations do something similar to this. They rejoiced because of its encouragement. Surely there was a party, a celebration for what the, the determination and declaration from the Jerusalem conference truly was. So let's close out our passage this morning, uh, verses 33 to 35. After spending some time there, they were sent off by the believers with the blessing of peace to return to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, where they and many others taught and preached the word of the Lord. And so with this final letter from the apostles and elders in Jerusalem, the saying is proved true, isn't it? The pen is mightier than the sword. Or... At least the pen is mightier than the flint knife that was used for circumcision, right? I had a lot of circumcision jokes in this message, and you'll probably be glad that you're watching this at home and not awkwardly sitting in the sanctuary at this time. The truth is, though, I had to cut most of them. Get it? All right. Anyway. Okay, the matter is settled, right? Nothing but the blood of Jesus is necessary for salvation. Jesus paid it all, and all to Him we owe. Gentile and Jew are brothers, arm in arm, equal under the gospel, saved by grace through faith. Full stop. That's the end. But, James says, but you will do well. This is what I want us to focus on this morning. But before we get to sort of these James clauses, I want to outline what I think is sort of a remarkable process of what happens at the Jerusalem Council. And not just sort of the process of what happens, but just how similar a lot of these issues are. Because sometimes we can read Acts 15, and we read these, these four prohibitions, and we think, this is weird. This has nothing to do with our church at this time. But actually, I think there are several things that 
relate directly to our church at this time. So I'm, I'm going to outline six, and the, the last one is going to be these Jakobsklassen. How similar uh, is this context to ours today? Well, first of all, we all wrestle with whether we should strangle our cows or not. No? All right. No? Vegans are really mad at me right now. Okay, no. The first one is this, that there has always been and always will be people who are looking to add to the gospel. Ron gave us sort of a master class in this last week, which is wonderful sort of history and, and bringing it right up to Acts 15 of the, of the covenantal promise of what is going on in this passage and what's behind it. Grace plus nothing. Grace plus nothing is the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is nothing that we can do to earn our salvation before God. When he was talking about this last week, I had this mental image, this sort of memory of uh, baking with my mom. I used to bake with my mom a lot growing up. And sometimes we would make meringue. And I just remember that, you know, as we're separating the eggs, how insistent my mom was that you can't get even one drop of that fatty yolk into the egg whites. Because even one drop will spoil the whole meringue. It won't rise. It won't do what it's supposed to do. Adding anything only takes away from the effectiveness of the gospel. So how we preach this gospel of grace will always matter. Number one thing that's the same, both in Acts 15 and in our church today. How we preach the message of grace plus nothing equals salvation matters. Number two, uh, false teachers often come from high places. I, um, I ordered this book this week from uh, Dorian Virtue. Dorian Virtue used to be sort of a, a minor celebrity in the New Age world, New Age spirituality. And she's uh, recently become a Christian and sort of um, recognized sort of the, the dangers of, of New Age spirituality and is now writing against sort of what has come out of that and where she has been and where she is now. What caught me, though, is in a review of the book that I was reading. And she was saying, um, as this sort of, she calls it a rock star sort of persona in, in the New Age world, as she was this sort of rock star in the New Age world, she realized that just because of who she was, uh, people would believe what she said. She didn't even really have to back it up. Just because of who she was, people would believe what she said. These men that came up from Jerusalem, they came sort of with this self-designation that they were, they were delegates of the mothership, of this great Jerusalem church, which housed a lot of the apostles, which had uh, James, the, the brother of Jesus, our Lord. Surely the church in Antioch would have been a little intimidated. We must listen to them. They come with authority. They come with power, right? But Paul and Barnabas came into sharp dispute with him. Why? Well, because they were more intent on searching the Scriptures and testing the spirits. So that's the second thing that we need to do. False teachers come from high places. We must always search the Scriptures and test every spirit. False teaching must be condemned. But number three, that's the draw of cultural relevance. That's ultimately what these Judaizers were after. To make the gospel of Jesus Christ a little bit more, I don't know, palatable, a little bit more comfortable to the Jewish people. Let's make it seem a little bit more culturally appropriate for them, and then, then well, then they'll accept the gospel of Jesus. And accommodating the gospel to our culture is always a temptation, has always been a temptation for the church. Now I, I think of things like virtue signaling and tokenism in the church, just how tempting it is for us to seem hip and with it and culturally relevant and, and not you know, some sort of old stuffy thing. But guess what? We are an old stuffy thing. The church is a beautiful old tradition that I think we need to embrace. We don't need to just chase the wind. Number four, the temptation to not address the threat. This again is, is in every context of the church throughout all time right? Let's just pretend that it's not there, and, and let's just hope it goes away, right? Oh, you have a, a, an open wound on your arm? Well, let's just ignore it and see what happens. Maybe it'll just heal itself, right? Maybe. 
Or maybe it will fester and infect, right? I remember a few years ago, I was talking to a, a pastor friend. And we were talking about things that I would consider to be weighty matters, really uh, sort of key, core, essential things. And um, he was talking about just how tiring it is, and surely it is for church leaders, to wrestle with these in a congregational setting. And he said, you know, I, I want to I uh, find a third way, not you know, this side or that side. I want to find a third way. And I was kind of intrigued. And I said, okay, well, tell me a little bit more about that. He says, oh, I just want to love people and not talk about it. Oh, okay, well, it might heal over or it might just fester up, right? Many of you have heard me use Brene Brown's um, very quotable line, and clarity is kindness. I absolutely think that is true in the church. I think the, the Jerusalem church models this for us, not only in its sort of deliberations in the conference, but how it writes back to the church in Antioch. This is what we've outlined. We are of one mind. We have decided this is where we stand. Number five, the difficult work of not turning a sharp dispute into a personal attack. Again, isn't that always a, a perennial issue in the church as we're in relationship together, as we're a body, as a family in the church? We need to learn to disagree on issues. Because if they truly are issues of sort of eternal significance, they matter a great deal. And so we should come into disagreement. We should hash this out. We should sharpen each other, right? We should push back. We shouldn't just say, oh, well, it doesn't matter. No, it does matter. And if it doesn't matter, if it's not an issue of eternal significance, then get over it. Get past it. Put it behind you, right? But don't let these things turn into resentment even issues of eternal significance. Don't let them turn into issues of, of personal hatred and attack between us. A young um, Spurgeon, when he, when he first went to Metropolitan Tabernacle in London to preach, he preached there for like 40 years or something like that. So he's probably, probably in his 20s when he went there. Shortly after he got there, he had wisdom beyond his years, always did. He was engaging in, in a man who had been there for years. And this man was holding this resentment and this bitterness, I think actually to his predecessor, to the, the preacher who had been there before. And um, Spurgeon met with them and, and continued to sort of work with him and try to get him to, to forgive this uh, older pastor and leave it behind. And uh, this man kept getting worked up and worked up. And finally one day he said to him, Mr. Spurgeon, facts don't change over time. And Spurgeon just looked at him and said, yeah. You're absolutely right. Facts don't change over time, but men should. You see, why haven't you changed? If, if you are on this path of discipleship, this growth trajectory toward maturity in the image of Jesus Christ, then you ought to change over time, which means that you ought to become more and more forgiving as you become more and more molded into the image of Jesus. Sharp disputes should happen. These are weighty matters, but personal vendettas and grudges are never okay. All right, final thing we um, take that is similar from, from our passage, actually the whole chapter of Acts 15 in our church today, and that, that's these James clauses, Jacob's clause. Things are not essential for salvation, but they're found at what I'm going to call the intersection of liberty and love. That's what James clauses are. They're not essential for salvation. Ron outlined that last week. But they're found at the intersection of liberty and love. Uh, John Newton, the great hymn writer, once wrote, an iron pillar, the church should be an iron pillar in essentials and a reed in non-essentials. An iron pillar in essentials and a reed in non-essentials. I want to go back to verse 25 of chapter 15 because there's this remarkable statement in the passage where it says the whole church agreed in this writing, this pronouncement, right, back to the church in Antioch. Again, I said you can translate it, they were of one mind. They were unanimous in this. Now, here's the thing. We know for a fact that they weren't, <laughs> right? They weren't unanimous. There were certain men who went up from Jerusalem to Antioch to teach something different. 
We know that there was difference of opinion in the church of Jerusalem. And yet, as they deliberated, as they came to this consensus together, it seems good to us and to the Holy Spirit, to pronounce this, they said they were of one mind. That is, some of them, some of them had submitted their own personal opinions to the will of the whole body and the leadership of the church. That's a beautiful thing. That's an, uh, an amazing thing that I, I don't think we can sort of understate here. I, I once asked a, a leader of a large organization, large staff, that was um, doing really well, incredibly successful, one of the sort of leading organizations in its field. What was the key to his success? And as so many humble leaders over the years have, have sort of um, expressed to me, it wasn't about him, he said. He said, no, look, when everyone is on the same page, with the same goal, holding the same values, it makes it so much easier to pursue the common mission of the organization. Everyone's moving in the same direction, is united in heart and mind as they pursue what the goal is of what they're doing. God's Spirit at work in God's church is the greatest potential agent of change in our world. I 100% believe that. When we're not infighting or navel-gazing. When we're not so obsessed with internal dissension that we can be outwardly focused. My constant prayer for this church is that we would continue to be on the same page with the same goals, holding the same values, so that we can actually pursue the same mission, which is bringing the gospel of grace in Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth. To every single person both here in Calgary and around the globe with our missions partners. Here's the practical or, or pragmatic reality of what we're talking about this morning. These internal differences and disagreements are, are unavoidable. I mean, unless we're all robots or unless we all just sort of turn off our brains or our hearts or something like that, right? They are going to happen. So let's not pretend that we're not going to have differences, However, the sooner they're brought out into the open, the sooner they're addressed, the more healthier that we can talk about these things together collectively, the sooner we can get back to what we're really called to do, bringing the gospel to the ends of the earth. So what do we do with minor disagreements and difference of opinion that fall into these sort of non-essential categories? Daryl Bach, a writer, says uh, this, and by this, he's talking about these Jacob's clauses and these James clauses in Acts chapter 15. It's not about salvation, but about what is necessary to maintain positive fellowship with each other. Positive fellowship. I really like that phrase. You see, these four prohibitions, if we're honest, sound a bit strange to our ear, don't they? Uh, stay away from meat used in idol worship, from blood, and from meat from strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. Why these four things? Why not other things, right? I mean, why, why doesn't the Jerusalem church just sort of like restate the Ten Commandments? You would do well to live by these moral guidelines, right? There's no way that this is sort of a comprehensive list of, of what the church in Antioch would do well to live by. It's not sort of some paternalistic, you know, oh, you ought to do this up there, right? They're not trying to tell them what to do and how to live. What they're trying to do is, look, we are sensitive to these things. We want you to be aware of that. It's quite clearly a list that was specifically addressing the pagan forms of idol worship in these regions. And they're saying, the Jerusalem church is saying, look, you might not have an issue with what goes on at these sort of civic festivals. What revolves around the pagan temples. You might just say, well, those are not real gods. <laughs> we know that. We worship the one true God. It doesn't bother us. Our consciences are, are fine. They're intact. But culturally, they're saying it's very offensive to us Jews. So that the church as a whole, brothers, Gentile and Jew, would do better if you could forego that. If you could just lay down your freedom. If you could sacrifice on our behalf so that we can actually get along better. So that we're not, uh, there's not a stumbling block, a scandal in our way to unity in the church. So that, so that the mission of God is pursued. 
We don't get caught up on these things. The whole discussion, this is fascinating to me, is actually played out again in, in a bit of a different way by Paul. This time he's talking in, um, in 1 Corinthians, so his first letter to the church in Corinth. It's almost the identical discussion, only this time there's no actual Jewish believers involved. That's what makes it so fascinating. You see, here, here the Jewish believers are saying, look, uh, we're sensitive to these things, so please forego them. But Paul, writing to the church in Corinth, chapters 8 to 10, around that section, he's writing to Gentile believers, saying, look, there are weaker brothers, there are weaker Gentile believers who don't know that it doesn't matter, that these are false gods, that there's nothing to worry about in this sort of meat sacrifice to idols. And so it's not about Jewish believers or Gentile ones per se. It, it can go both ways in the church. And Paul puts it this way in, in 1 Corinthians 8, 9. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block, a scandal to the weak. That is, just because you know that you're not doing anything wrong, it doesn't mean that you're doing something right. Let me say it again. Just because you know that you're not doing something wrong, it doesn't mean that you're doing something right. You're not necessarily making the best choice. And later on in the same letter, chapter 10, verse 24, he says, no one should seek their own good, but the good of others. That is, be sensitive not to intentionally offend. The gospel offends, by the way, we're told that, right? The exclusivity of Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We know that that is offensive to much of our world, but here, that is not what is being talked about. Here, what's being talked about is, is the behavior, the way we live together, the way we navigate this, this thing called community, church, right? You will do well not to needlessly offend those who are sensitive. There's this really interesting part of Acts, and we're cutting it off sort of arbitrarily at the end of chapter 15. And this comes right near the beginning of chapter 16. I was really tempted to stretch it out a little bit. So this great sort of conference in Acts 15, it takes up the whole chapter, central part of the book of Acts, right? And they deliberate and they say, no, you, do, you don't need to become Jewish to become Christian. You don't need to be circumcised to become Christian. After this happens, uh, Paul is going to go back with Silas and he's going to go visit uh, these churches that he preached in in this first missionary journey. And he's back in Lystra. Remember Lystra? And I told you when we preached on this passage that this is where Timothy is from. And in chapter 16, this is where he actually sort of adds Timothy to the crew. Timothy becomes sort of one of his, his fellow missionaries here. And it tells us in verse 3 that Paul on this missionary trip takes Timothy and he circumcises him. Now, I'm really glad that's not part of my job description. So if I ever invite you to be on a missions trip with me, don't worry about that, all right? But this seems so bizarre, so surprising. Like, didn't just a chapter ago, didn't we just have this massive first church council and decide that this wasn't necessary? But I think this just underscores the point even more. Because Paul is saying, look, yeah, we heard the Jacob's Clausen. We heard the James Clauses, that, that we would do well not to offend the sensitivity of the Jews. But we're going to go even beyond the minimum requirements there. We will do whatever it takes in our life to ensure that, that our witness is not marred by being insensitive to the Jews. I say Paul, but really it's Timothy that goes that far, right? And he says, I'll go through with this. Not because I think it's necessary for salvation, but because I don't want any scandal, any stumbling block when I preach in communities that have both Jew and Gentile believers. Liberty and love. It's a, it's a strange thing. Somewhere along the way, our culture has really got these things mixed up. We tend to see James clauses as a sort of loss of our personal freedom, a constraint on my rights. They impinge on my freedom. You can't tell me what to do. You can't tell me what I can or can't do, right? I'm free in Christ. The gospel sets me free from the law. Yes, that's true. But the message of the gospel is that James' clauses are, are not a loss of freedom, actually. They're, they're choosing the right kind of freedom. They're freedom to love one another. 
Our liberty is always for the purpose of our love. We're free to love. We're not simply free from the law. Ron mentioned this just sort of in passing. I want to bring this out a little bit more this week. Freedom to or freedom for something compared to freedom from something. We're free to love. We're free for love in the Christian context. Not simply free from the law. These are two ways of of viewing freedom. Freedom from, negative freedom, and freedom for, positive freedom. The church ought to be far more interested in a positive view of freedom than a negative one. Let me just highlight, illustrate the the difference. Picture this. Imagine a man driving a car. And he comes to an intersection. There's nothing at the intersection. No, No traffic lights or stop signs or anything like that. There's no blockades of any kind. There's nothing sort of uh, forcing him to go one way. There's no police directing traffic. He's completely free. There's no other cars there. He chooses to turn left. And we would say um, that that's freedom. In some ways, uh, coming up to the intersection is, is sort of this negative freedom. Nothing is, is constraining him or constricting him. Nothing is forcing him to choose one way or another. Right? Now, let me... Um, a little bit more of the picture. Let's imagine for a minute that this man was actually going to uh, an appointment, very important, important appointment that he wanted to get to on time. He chose to turn left, actually, to go into the convenience store to buy cigarettes. And in doing so, he actually was late for the important appointment that he wanted to make it to. Now we get a little bit different picture of what's going on as far as freedom goes. You see, he, he had this negative freedom. Nothing was sort of impinging upon him except, well, except his addiction. And his ad- addiction took him left, and in doing so, he forfeited his positive freedom, what he wanted to do, get to this important appointment on time, because, well, because he was sort of beholden to this addiction in his life. So it was the addiction that was really steering the car. So he had a a lack of positive freedom. He actually couldn't will what he chose, what he wanted to will in his life, what was actually good. We might say that while the first view, liberty, is simply about how many doors are open to us. This is negative freedom. How many doors are open to us, right? On the second view, positive freedom, it's more about can we go through the right doors at the right time? The church in Jerusalem, I think, is saying all the doors are open, friends. They're all open. But you would do well to consider what is the right door for the right reasons. How do we know what are the right doors? Well, by considering what it means to love one another. This is all, I think, under the category of sort of voluntary sacrifice in our lives. Verse 26 of our passage is this sort of shout out to the missionary journey of of Paul and Barnabas and the great work that they did. And the Jerusalem church writes, these are men who have risked their lives, no, not for fame or fortune, but for the furthering of the gospel, the mission of God to the ends of the earth. They have sacrificed themselves for this purpose, positive view of freedom. One of my all-time favorite scriptures perhaps unsurprisingly, comes in the middle of this this 1 Corinthians section. 1 Corinthians 9, Paul says, let me just read a few verses. Though I am free to belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the weak I become weak, to win the weak. I become all things to all people so that by all means, all possible means, I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. What is sacrifice? Sacrifice is to forfeit something for something else that is of greater value. That's what sacrifice is. Friends, our our culture will tell us a lie, won't it? You can have it all. You don't need to sacrifice for anything. Sacrifice is bad, right? You can have your cake and eat it too, or 
You can have your cake and lose pounds too, right? You can get shredded and not go to the gym. You can get rich and not work for it, right? This is what the whole lottery system is actually premised upon. And it's an incredibly seductive fantasy, isn't it? I would argue that all of us get sucked into it in one way or another at some point in our lives. Some of us get sucked into it in a vortex that we just can't simply get out of. I can get everything I want without giving up anything. But friends, sacrifice and freedom aren't contradictions. They aren't contradictions. There's this great story of of, uh, this player who used to play in the NBA basketball. His name, great name, Jimmer Ferdet. Pretty awesome. And he's like this shorter white guy Uh, Not the kind of person you would think maybe that would make the NBA. And he was playing college basketball. And he was sort of going through the first three years. And, and he, you know, he was a starter. He was fine. But it was pretty clear he wasn't going to make the NBA. And uh, the summer before his draft year, his final year in college, he sat down with with his brother. And his brother said, Jimmer, what's your goal? And he said, well, I still have the same goal. I want to play in the NBA. He said, well, what's it going to take for you to get there? And they sat down together, and they crafted this sort of handwritten contract. I will give up these foods. I will get up at this time. I will shoot this many shots. I will train this hard. I will, all of these things that Jimmer was willing to do in order to reach that positive freedom, that door that he wanted to go through. His fourth year in college was uh, remarkable. He was the best shooter in the country. Ended up getting drafted to the NBA and playing a short career in the NBA. We hear all stories of this all the time, of, of these sort of driven, disciplined people in our world who have these remarkable sense of positive freedom. Freedom to sacrifice certain options, to close certain doors in order that they can make it through the doors that they want. What is their goal? What about in the context of the church? What about in the context of being on mission for the gospel of Jesus Christ? What about when it's not, you know, for this sort of self-serving personal goal? What about when it's not for our own quote-unquote success? Here's the point, I think. We want a church that is on mission to go to the ends of the earth. Each of us is going to need to make sacrifices in order to show our love for one another that's just a a basic fact there's no way around that it turns out too that sacrifice in the context of of a family of a body of christ of a church is what true love actually means the giving up and giving over of ourselves of our own freedoms of our own rights for the sake of the betterment of others john 15 13 and 17 greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends This is my command, Jesus says. Love one another. Love them in this way by laying down your life for them. When was the last time you laid down a freedom for the sake of someone else? I don't ask that because I I think you haven't. I think you have. But I just want you to reflect on it for a minute. Don't tell me that you love your brother or sister but you aren't willing to give up your rights and freedoms for their sake. Here's the gospel promise in all this. When you understand the calling of freedom to love your brother and sister in sacrificial ways, you'll begin to, to feel truly free yourself. The Spirit of God will will be within you, will bring a a peace that passes understanding in your life. It will bring a a joy that it's not sort of uh, beholden to the circumstances of your life. You're not going to go up and down, but there will be this sustained, continual joy. You'll have the fruits of the Spirit. They'll just be coming out of you. You see, it's not just sacrifice. Oh, ho-hum, I guess, poor me. We learn that this is the gospel life. This is the promise that Jesus brings us. Behold, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. It's precisely what psychiatrist Victor Emile Frankl observed when he he lived among his fellow prisoners. 
Men, by the way, who had been stripped of every vestige of negative freedom. There was no doors open to them in these Nazi concentration camps. By all means, you would say that they had zero freedom. He writes this in one of his books. In spite of all the enforced physical and mental primitiveness of the life in a concentration camp, it was possible for the spiritual life to deepen. Only in this way can one explain the apparent paradox that some prisoners of a less hardy makeup often seem to survive camp life better than did those of a robust nature. The experiences of camp life show that man does have a choice of action. Even, I would add, when there's seemingly no outward freedom of choice. We who lived in concentration camps can remember the men who walked through the huts comforting one another, giving away their last piece of bread. Sacrifice in love. They may have been few in number, he says, but they offer sufficient proof that everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances to choose one's own way. I would add, to choose the way of love, the way of Jesus Christ, by sacrificing for the sake of others. You will do well, Jacob's clauses, James clauses, you will do well not to trumpet your newfound freedom in the gospel of grace, but to willingly, generously, sacrificially lay down your rights and your freedoms for your fellow brothers and sisters, so that the mission of God to the ends of the earth can be accomplished. Let's pray. God, we need your help in all this because we know that we are inherently selfish. We know that we cling to our rights and our freedoms and we think that they are of the highest value it's hard for us to understand the upside-down kingdom. To understand that as we, as we release them, as we give them over, as we hand over our rights and freedoms, as we sacrifice for each other, that is where true freedom is found. That is the door we want to walk through together. May you help us in this. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.
I don't think it should be surprising to us that um, right after this passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 to 10, where Paul is, is discussing these things about our liberty and our love, our choice to lay down our freedoms and our rights for the sake of the other, that he comes to the Lord's table. He talks about communion. And he begins it in this sort of troubling way. Clearly there's an issue here in the church. He says, in the following directives, I have no praise for you. For your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. No doubt, there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. So then, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. For when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers, and as a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall we say to you? Shall I praise you 
Certainly not in this manner. Pretty serious stuff, right? Then he moves on. He says, For I have received from the Lord what I have also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night He was betrayed, took bread. When He had given thanks, He broke it and said, This is My body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of Me. In the same way, after the supper, He took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in My blood. Do this whenever you drink of it in remembrance of Me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. We partake rightly when we are sacrificing in love, laying down our liberty for the sake of our brother and sister. Let's pray. God, may these gifts be for us, Your body and Your blood. May they strengthen us again this week. We need it. Each and every week we come to this table. We're broken. We recognize uh, our selfishness. We understand that um, we are not worthy in and of ourselves to be at this table, but through the death of Your Son, through His blood, You have made us worthy. That we are saved by grace through faith. Brothers and sisters, around one common table. It's in Jesus' name, and by the power of Your Holy Spirit we pray. Amen.
children. 